this morning's reading is taken from 2 Samuel chapter 6. Uh, this can be found on page 310 in the church Bibles. So that's 2 Samuel chapter 6, beginning at verse 12. Now King David was told, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women. And all the people went to their homes. When David returned home to bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants, as any vulgar fellow would. David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. And Michal, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everybody. It's lovely to be with you, especially if you're new today. And if you are, I'd love to meet you afterwards. My name's Stuart, and I'm the vicar here. And this morning, we are looking at the topic of worship. And I think it's actually quite a personal topic. Uh, quite a sensitive topic for some of us, but it's a really, really important one. So we're going to look at this passage together. But let's pray before we, before we dive in. Lord, we invite you um, to come now. I pray you would strengthen me as I speak. And you'd be with each of us as we listen. Would we hear the encouragements, the challenges, the directions you have for us from your word. Amen. Wonderful. Well, um, yeah, we're thinking about the topic of worship today. And, um, you know, I don't know about you, but as I come to read this passage and I'm thinking on this topic, I do find this scene of David kind of worshipping uh, slightly over-enthusiastically a little bit embarrassing. I don't know whether you, you feel that or not. Um, and I have to be honest that as a church leader, I really can't read this passage through without avoiding the lens of like, what does this mean for us as a church in terms of our worship? What kind of awkward conversations is it going to lead to afterwards about our worship here at HT? Um, because it is quite challenging, if we're honest. Here we have King David, who is supposedly the hero of the story, story the, the, the man whose heart is after God, and he is being presented to us as the wacky worship weirdo. Let's, let's be honest. We can all think of uh, a wacky worship weirdo that we know. Um, someone, somebody who at some time has embarrassed us in, in worship. Don't nudge the person next to you. If you can't think of anyone, it might be you. So just be careful. And, you know, even if that isn't the case, many of us, I'm sure, can... Uh, think of times uh, of worship, maybe here at HT, maybe at a conference or somewhere else, where there's, ha there's been an embarrassing moment. You know, there, there are a few kind of common ones, aren't there? There are the, the over-enthusiastic uh, over 
enthusiastic hand wavers, who, especially in those conference seats, really go for the face. Don't know if you've ever been hit in the face uh, during, during worship. There's the, 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 the over-animated kind of prancer who maybe steps on a toe, and then there's an awkward moment when you have to acknowledge that. And then I think a little bit more commonly, sometimes there's the sort of over-expression of emotion, and it seems that everyone else is there worshipping very dignifiedly, and then someone is just breaking down. They're sobbing there. They're pouring this, this snot and everything, and maybe they're really going for it. And, and, and you know, we think, well, that's really exciting. I kind of wish I could worship like that, but also it's a little bit awkward, and uh, especially if we brought a friend with us to church that day. It's kind of, oh, hmm. Well, I find it really interesting that uh, in this story, uh, Mikhail, we don't really know how to pronounce it, but Mikhail, uh, David's wife, seems to also be embarrassed of him. That is what we're told at the end of the story. As she watches this scene unfold, uh, we're told that she despises her husband in her heart. And then when David gets home, she says to him, you have been making a fool out of yourself. You have been embarrassing yourself. You are, you are a king, and you really should start acting like one. That's what she says to him. Now, I think it would be easy to write, write her off uh, and just say, well, she's obviously not the worship type. She's obviously a little bit uptight, so let's ignore her. But actually, she, she, if we look twice, she actually has a really good point. This is an extraordinarily important moment for Israel and for David. The nation of Israel is a really small, fragile nation at this point. They have only ever had one king in their whole history. And if you've read the story, it's gone badly. And now, in front of all the people and all the leaders and all the military men, (laughs) this is the new King David's opportunity to be the statesman to project power and authority and composure as he comes in with the ark of God into Jerusalem. And instead, he is worshipping like a wacky weirdo. And the big question which Mikhail kind of invokes over this whole passage, which we're meant to get, the big question hanging over it is, is this the kind of king that God wants for his people? Is this really the kind of king God wants? Does God want a statesman like Saul, the former king who came in bearing himself like a king, very respectable? Or is this new king, David, worshipping like a wacky weirdo, really what God wants from his king? And of course, the reason that it's a pertinent question is because the same question hangs over us, doesn't it? You know, is this what God wants, this worship that we see from David? Is it what he wants from his vicar? Is it what he wants from his church wardens? Is it what he wants from you, respectable Cambridge people? And I don't know about you, I find it a little bit uncomfortable. Because the short answer is, yes, (laughs) it is what God wants from us. And as we read on about David and we read the Psalms, we see that one of the things that distinguished David most as king was his heart for worship. He was a wholehearted worshiper. And in fact, we might go further and say, (laughs) the reason David was such a good king was because, first of all, he was such a good worshiper. That is something that God loved about David. So, Here's the question. Do we really have to dance and prance and embarrass ourselves to worship in a way that pleases God's heart? Do we have to look like David here? I think I'll I'll, I'll cut to the end. I don't think we necessarily have to, but I think that there are several things we can really learn from David about the nature of worship that might encourage us and challenge us in our own worship life. So we're going to look at a few things that this passage tells us about worship. The first thing it tells us, actually, is that our worship should be faithful. Our worship should be faithful. I'm going to explain that. Often, I think, when we read this passage, the first thing we notice is is David's exuberance, his passion, and that's what we, we look at, and we'll come back to that. 
But actually, when, when we, we look at it a bit more deeply, the first major point that this passage makes about worship is it needs to be faithful to how God wants to be worshipped. It's an interesting thing to notice. The story of David bringing the ark into Jerusalem doesn't actually begin where we started reading. It begins at the beginning of chapter 6. And uh, that it begins with the, David's first attempt to bring the ark into Jerusalem. And if you've ever read the story, it is rather disturbing because one of the priests dies in the attempt. As they are traveling towards Jerusalem, uh, the oxen that is pulling the cart with the ark on it stumbles. The ark begins to fall. One of the priests, uh, Uzziah, puts his hand out to steady it. And instantly, there and then, God puts him to death. And the whole thing grinds to a halt. And if you're slightly disturbed by that story, you are in good company. Because David was both furious and absolutely terrified. He didn't know what to do with this. And I, I certainly would shake up our worship times if occasionally someone just fell over at the back. Um, it's, it's quite terrifying to think, what is God doing in the midst of this worship time? So what's going on? Well, it seems that the core issue here is that David is worshipping like a Philistine. David is worshipping like a Philistine. When we go to the Old Testament law, we find that there are actually quite strict instructions for how God's people were supposed to worship him, and in particular, how they were supposed to transport the ark of his presence. And in particular, they're not supposed to carry it on a cart, which we're told multiple times that David was doing in the first attempt, but the priests are supposed to carry the ark using two poles. So how has this new cart carrying snuck into David's worship. Well, actually, I think it's probably that David hasn't very, haven't thought about it very much. It turns out that transporting the ark on a new cart was just what the Philistines did last time the ark was moved. It's quite a while ago now. You can go and read the story in 1 Samuel chapter 6. But when the Philistines returned the ark, they honored it. They thought they were honoring the presence of God by putting it on a brand new cart. And that was their way of, of worshiping, if you like, honoring it. And so that was the first way it's moved. And I think David has just gone, great, we'll just do that again. The thing is, even though that was a way of honoring it, David should have known better. And he forgot to ask the key question, how does my God want to be worshipped? So he sticks it on a new cart. Now, I just think this is a really, really significant because it means that the first thing we read as we come to our passage is actually really important. We find that the priests in the second attempt are now carrying the ark uh, on poles. We also read that David is now wearing the official linen ephod. We also hear that they're now offering the right sacrifices. And that's quite poignant. What it means is that... At even though we see David dancing exuberantly, worshipping freely and passionately, actually, he is now expressing that freedom within actually a relatively strict framework of faithfulness to what God has told him. And that's quite challenging for us. I think we live in a world where often we talk about worship as if it's just, it's just about our style, our expression. As long as you mean it, it's fine. You know, especially in a contemporary church, we really want to kind of be, um, you know, with it, if you put it that way. But I wonder, have you ever asked the question about how you worship? Has it ever occurred to you that God cares about how we worship him? That it isn't just about us and how we want to do it. That how we do it matters to God. It is all too easy for us to accidentally fall into worshipping like Philistines. Now, there's so much we could say at this point. I mean, it would be quite fun to go on a bit of a tirade, uh, but I won't. But just one application, I think, of this that, that's, I think, important is that I think our worship, we should import it is important that it's based on truth. You know, Jesus says in John 4, the, the worshipers that will worship me, they will worship me in spirit and in truth. 
And it, it isn't just about self-expressiveness or where we're at. Actually, we want our uh, worship to be leading us toward the God who has shown us what he's like. A few, a few little things, therefore. You know, the words that we worship to matter. The words of our songs, the words that you have on your playlist at home, the words that you do or don't use in prayer, you know, they matter. What we sing and who, uh, who it is we describe God as. That doesn't mean that they have to be long and complicated and theological. If you go and read the Psalms, they're not. But they are drawing us towards God and what he's told us like, told us he's like in the scriptures. And maybe a, a, a bigger question to ask of your worship, maybe you can go away and have a look at your worship playlist and ask, do the wider themes of my worship reflect the themes of worship in Scripture? Or have I got in a, stuck in a rut of just praise and no lament? Or just, you know, just the good side of God and not the challenging sides? Or does my worship reflect what God has said about himself? And is it drawing me deeper into who he is? Or am I worshipping like a Philistine, just bringing, just bringing what, from what's around me into my worship life? So the first thing we see in this passage is that worship is meant to be faithful. The second, though, is that worship is also meant to be from the heart. You know, we've emphasized faithfulness, but it's so clear from this passage that it's meant to be free and from the heart. David's example here is totally unmistakable. He's, he's doing what God's told him to do, but he's bringing way more than that to the party. He is bringing his whole heart and his whole self. We're told a few things that give the game away. We're told that he's dancing before the Lord. And, you know, I don't know how you imagine dancing in worship. I mean, it's not the Anglican charismatic sway. That is not the sum of dancing before the Lord. You know, we are told, rather, that David is dancing with all his might. He is absolutely going for it. And um, I don't know, have you ever really danced before the Lord? Or can you ever say you've worshipped with all your might? It's a challenging question, isn't it? And we also told he's not just singing. And he's, not, he's not doing the Gregorian chants, put it that way. He is shouting. He is crying out at the top of his voice. And... You know, we can't just put this down to culture. I mean, culture plays a really important role in worship. You know, we need to take account for it. But the thing is, his wife is from his culture, and she's still really embarrassed of him. So he's obviously really going for it. And as we look wider in the Scriptures, we see it's really clear that God doesn't just want faithfulness. He doesn't just want the truth, the right words in the right order. What he's really looking for beyond that is for us to bring our hearts. It's for us to come and delight in him, in our hearts. That's why I think so often in the Psalms, David writes things like this. Bless the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise the Lord. So, another very simple question. When you come to worship, do you bring your heart? Do you engage your heart? And I know that we're all wired slightly differently. Um, you know, we all express emotions differently. We come from different backgrounds. But still, there, there are some helpful questions to ask here. You know, what do you do with your heart and your emotions as you come to worship? Do you think worship is about bottling up your heart, bottling up your emotions and where you're at, putting them on a side so you can just say the right things to God? Or rather, do you bring your heart before the Lord, everything that's going on, the ups, the downs, where you're at, and, 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 and try and engage from the center of your being? And if you don't feel like worshiping, what do you do? Do you say, well, oh, it's not a good day today, that's a shame. <laughs> or do you say, okay, well, it's not a good day today, but Lord, would you change my heart? <laughs> Lord, would you help me as I work through these things? I really do, from the bottom of my heart, want to be able to say, hallowed be your name, before I leave this time. And I think alongside that, there is a bit of a challenge here about how we express our worship. 
And that is, after all, how we know that David is really going for it. And I know I slightly cheekily mocked some of the awkward times in worship at the beginning, but it, how we express worship and our freedom in that is really, really important. So, you know, a couple of challenges here. David challenges us to think about our bodies and how we use our bodies in worship. Again, I don't think we need to necessarily dance like he was dancing. I can see some worried faces. But our bodies really change our hearts as well as our hearts change our bodies. It's not so obvious to me which leads which always. And I think for many years I thought, you know, I'll just wait till I feel like dancing before I dance, feel like lifting my hands before I lift my hands. But actually I've discovered quite often it's the other way around. It's quite often as I decide, Lord, I'm going to worship you today. Or Lord, no, I am actually going to be open to you today. And as I choose to express that, I don't know if you've ever knelt during a time of prayer or worship. Sometimes it's just a decision, but to come before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going to choose this posture as a way of entering into a heart of surrender or open. Whether you come with your, you know, a closed posture or an open posture, whether you come to praise, these things make a big difference. They make a difference to us and our hearts, and they make a difference to one another. We encourage each other when we bring our bodies into worship. Just watch out for the person next to you. And then I think also there's a challenge here about our voices, isn't there? Again, we don't necessarily have to shout and scream. But there is a reason why so much of biblical worship is, is sung and vocal. Um, there's a lot of research gone in actually, actually into the power of vocalizing things. And again, sometimes we, 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 we think, I'll just wait till I feel it, till I say it. But words mean things. We, we were at a wedding yesterday. You know, and I tell you what, I do <laughs> means something in that context. You know, it's a commitment. It's a, kind of, it's a decision as well as an emotion. And I encourage us that some of us feel less comfortable with this, but one of the ways we can lead our hearts in worship is by choosing to vocalize things, even sometimes before we feel them. And uh, just to add, in case you haven't worked this out during our times of worship here, you don't always have to sing what's on the screen. <laughs> it's just like, we'll set you free for that in case you haven't worked that out. It's not just about singing the words on the screen. Um, we want to bring our hearts to the Lord, and we, that means sometimes bringing our own words to God. I love what our former worship pastor, Ed Cork, used to say. He says, the words on the screen are like the words in a thank you card. You know, when you open a thank you card you've been given, and there's the printed words, thank you. It's like, great, thank you, wonderful. But what you really care about, don't you, is what the person who has written around it. As they've personalized it, and they've written to you. They've made it their own. That's what you care about. And I think that's a great picture for what we have the words on the screen. Sometimes they're very simple. Sometimes we repeat them. Oh my word, we repeat them. But they're an opportunity really to us to bring our hearts and to bring our own words, sometimes internally as we just pray, but often we have times where the music fades away and it's just an opportunity for us to sing out, pray out, make the conversation our own between us and God because God is after our hearts. And finally, thirdly and finally, we see in this passage that worship should be focused on lifting God up. Worship should be focused on lifting God up in our lives. When we stand back and we look at all that's going on and the type of ceremony that David um, is, is, is conducting here as he brings the ark into Jerusalem, a really interesting thing um, comes out. Scholars tell us that this ceremony most resembles an ancient enthronement ceremony of a king. Isn't that interesting? David is enthroning God in Jerusalem. We don't know what they were singing. We're told they are singing. We don't know what they were singing as they came into Jerusalem. But David penned many psalms that picture and and sing about the enthroning of God. Maybe, just maybe, they were singing the words from Psalm 24. You might know them. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors. In other words, open the gates. Make way that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? Is it David? No. 
the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. You see, this is where he and his wife, Michal, disagree. You see, at the very point where David might have been tempted to put himself at the center, to make this about his enthronement and his kingship, he has made this about the Lord and enthroning him. And this really is the center of worship. This is what is at the heart. The heart of worship is the joyful enthroning of God in our lives. That's what it's all about. And I want to tell you, it, we don't do it because it's easy. We do it precisely because so often it's hard. I, I don't know about you, but when I come to times of worship, sometimes it's in the morning, sometimes it's here, Sometimes my heart is red hot and raring to go, and I just can't wait. I'm way ahead of the worship leader. It's great, and I'm praising the Lord. Other, other times, I'll tell you what worship feels like. I can feel like the whole time is like my heart is in the microwave, slowly on defrost, warming up, before the final line of the final song, I finally mean it, if I'm lucky. You had that experience before? Sometimes worship is really hard. And some of us might even find that there are whole periods of our life where worship is, is hard. It feels like every day is like that. Our hearts in the microwave on defrost. But the key thing is that wherever we start, we are moving towards enthroning God in our lives, however easy or difficult it is. Because although it's really simple thing to lift God up, to celebrate his goodness and enthrone him in our lives, it is incredibly powerful and profound. You know, worship is no less than the reversal of the great fall in the Garden of Eden. You know, Adam and Eve's sin was very simple there too. They distrusted God's goodness and they decentered him from their lives. They dethroned him. And every time we come to worship and we celebrate God's goodness and we enthrone him in our lives, we are reversing that with God's help. We are putting him back at the center. We're doing battle with the lies of the enemy that come at us about us and about God and about the world. We are wrestling with our own hearts. We're saying, no, I refuse to put me at the center. I'm going to put God at the center. We're pushing back on those doubts, those discouragements and distractions. We're saying, no, 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 I know it looks like this, but I am going to lift you up. I am going to live for you today. It is really powerful stuff. And that is why I think so often God does amazing things while we worship. While we simply lift him up, he often comes, speaks, and heals, and does things. It's simply because when he is at the center, he loves to work. And this, I think, is what God loves about David. Absolutely loves about David. That really, at the heart of us, he, God is at the center for David. And when his wife comes to him and says, this is so embarrassing. You should, have, you should have been more of the statesman. He says, this wasn't about me. This wasn't about me. I was dancing not before everyone else, but before the Lord. And you know what? If I end up getting even more embarrassed by this, so be it. Because actually, it's about, it's about him. It's about his kingship. And I'm going to enthrone him in Jerusalem. We were made to worship. As we worship, everything else finds its place. It's powerful. It can be really, really difficult. Sometimes the hardest thing we'll do any given day is just choose to praise God. But he loves it when we move towards him. So God looks for faithful worship. He looks for it to be from the heart. But really what he looks is for us to forget ourselves and focus on him and lift him high. And then he loves to work. King David was the greatest king of Israel because he was, first of all, a worshiper. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have an opportunity to worship. Now, I just want a bit of a caveat. Having just talked about worship, we could easily become way too self-conscious about it. And I just want to say, let's just forget each other around. There's no, no one's watching each other. We're just going to have about 20 minutes or so, I guess, um, of, of, of time to worship Use this time how you want to. Stand up, sit down, sing the words on the screen, sing your own words, do battle with yourself, do battle with God. But let's choose to engage with God. And then 
as we go into our weeks and lives, maybe just ask yourself, how's my worship life going? A am I worshiping? Am I engaging my heart? Am I lifting the Lord high? What do you want to speak to me today? So can I invite us to stand? What, we're not going to have a sort of um, a stop for the ministry time or anything like that. So can I ask some of the, the, the ministry, um, uh, prayer ministry team just to come and be at the front. You can just worship at the front here. And if anyone would like to be prayed for or just would feel like you're meeting with the Lord or would like to just maybe into this topic or another, during, during the worship time, we're going to have about 20 minutes or so, then just come to the front. I'll connect you with someone to pray for. So if, if people willing to pray could come now. Otherwise, I'm just going to pray for us, and we're going to have a block of lifting up the Lord in our hearts together. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this example of David. And um, I, I don't think there'll be many of us who aren't challenged a bit by it in some way or another. Lord, thank you that we have to, we see that David has to learn how to worship too. And we pray you'd pour out your Holy Spirit on us. Would you set us free to worship in spirit and in truth? Lord, for those of us for whom this is really challenging this morning, and it's a real offering to just bring the most basic praise, we pray you'd come and meet with us. For others of us, Lord, who who have become a bit complacent, Lord, would you would you fill us afresh with your Spirit, that we would catch a glimpse of your glory? You really, really are worthy. Help us to bring the honour you deserve. Amen.